Hi everyone, how are you? I hope you're doing fantastic today. Welcome to Luan Live Sessions. Hope every one of you doing fantastic. I want to give you a big warm welcome to our new series, Igniting Life. Water that does not flow stagnates, rots, and smells bad. But all life that does not flow also rots and smells bad too. Our life is only worth it of this name if it flows, if it is in motion whether out of cowardice or laziness or even inertia, although it is almost always fear that mostly paralyzes us. We tend to stay still and even more to lock ourselves up. Casting ourselves is not just staying still, it is to hinder any future movement. As Pablo de Oro said, we look for jobs that assure us, a future that assure us, firm and clear ideas, rights that gives us an impression of continuity, we look for protected housing, well-covered sanitary systems, low-risk investments, insurance, and so on. And this is how the river of life finds obstacles in its course, until one day, without warning, it stops flowing. We live, yes, but very often we are dead. We have survived ourselves. There is biology, but not biography. Fantastic quote by Pablo Doris. With this reflection, it is our great honor to welcome so many art professionals and change makers from around the world joining us in today's edition of Change and Movement. Luan, international curated experiences that connect beauty, truth, and ethical reflection, brings inspiring voices from the intersection of art, ethics, and mindfulness into the lives of individuals on all continents. We're going to play a short video about Luan to give you a little bit of more context. How many times have we been told that it's wrong to feel? How many times have you walked and ignored the landscape? It's time to stop and think about what we can do today to change tomorrow. To realize that as long as the sun goes down and comes out again, there is an opportunity to make a change. Because if we can dream of a better world, we can create it. Let's explore beyond what we can see at a glance. Let's make our inspiration, imagination and creativity the main elements of the world we want. Let's analyze our decisions and discover what drives us to go in a deep state of reflection that provides us with tools to create good day by day. May the freedom to play and the empowerment of our individual and collective ethics guide the way, feel, believe and create. The change we're waiting for depends on us. Luan, Emotional Museum. This series is about change and movement, and it offers an interactive platform to encourage resilience, meaning, and collective conscience through diverse artistic practices. Let's question ourselves and, and share the quest for the answers that we seek together, finding ways to unlock our deepest potential through art exercises, deep reflection, and sharing them with others through artistic experiences. Before introducing today's distinguished speaker, I would like to briefly share some speaking requests to help make today's session more interactive and engaging for all of you who have joined. In the bottom of the screen, you will see a control panel with a chat. Please go there now and write your name, country of residence, and your organization. In the control panel, you will also find the question section. You're encouraged to engage directly with other panelists by posting a question for them in the questions box. Please have in mind that you need to select the option sent to all panelists and attendees for everyone to see your post or question. Please submit your questions as early as possible in the session as there will be a limit to how many can be answered. Before we start, let me introduce myself. My name is Marion from Luan Emotional Museum. I want to thank you all so much for being here today with us. I see in the chat box that we have people from all over the world and this is very, very exciting. It is my pleasure to welcome today Dr. Feggy Ostrowski. She's professor of neuropsychology at the Faculty of Psychology of the National University of Mexico, where she is also head of the neuropsychology and psychophysiology laboratory of the graduate school. She obtained her bachelor's in psychology and has graduated studies, master's and PhD from the Department of Communicative Disorders at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. And also she received a PhD in biomedicine from the Faculty of Medicine of the National University of Mexico. 
She is a founding member and has been president of the Mexican Neurophysiological Society, founded in 1982, and in 2006 was president of the Latin American Neuropsychological Society. Her main interest includes the development of neuropsychological tests for Spanish-speaking population, the study of cultural and education and effects on neuropsychological testing and neuropsychological and psychophysiological profiles of several neuropsychiatry and medical disorders, such as Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and schizophrenia. She has published 29 books, six neuropsychological tests that have been standardized in Spanish-speaking population according to age and educational level, and over more than 340 journal articles and chapters in national and international journals with peer review. She has received several awards, is member of several national and international scientific committees and holds a position within the National System of Research of Mexico. Her work has been reported in several news and media, including Discovery Channel, TED Talks, CNN, and is advisor of several radio and TV channels in Mexico. Wow, her bio is absolutely amazing. In today's session, Art, Brain and Dementia, we will explore how artistic experience in human beings is linked to emotion, brain functioning, and creativity. Because highly creative individuals wave together drive, skill, and imagination to generate new ideas and actions. Art reflects the inner world of the artist, whether the artist is healthy or diseased. In this session, we will travel through the fascinating world of the brain and explore how visual creativity may emerge in the context of brain disease. The mysterious work of exceptional artists whose creativity arose and intensified as their brain began to degenerate. I encourage you today to be curious and to enjoy this experience. Let's have fun together and let Peggy work her magic through this enriching experience. Peggy, please take the stage. Thanks so much for being here today with us. Hi, uh, good morning. It's really a pleasure to be with, with, this, uh, with Marion and these all the people who follow Luan Musical Museum of Emotional Experience. And I'm gonna share my slides. Wait a second. Uh, I need your permission, Marion, so I can share my slides. I think it says, it says, could you uh, habilitate Peggy, please? Hold on one second. There you go. Okay. No, I can't. Let me see. Here, here we are. So, one second. Perfect. Oh, it's just not in the beginning, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So here we are. So um, this is a topic that is fascinating. So uh, for me, and I hope it's gonna be for you. Um, in uh, Raymond Chandler, who is a writer, he um, wrote, there are two types of truth. The truth lies the road and that science, which I have been doing that for 40 years. And I started very young. And the one that lights up the soul, which is art. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about both, the science and the art. So when we talk, I, I invite you to travel to a wonderful organ, that's the brain, it just, made, it just weighed 1.5 kilos, which is like three pounds, and is the most marvelous and amazing organ in the body. Um, it's the seeds of creativity, of, of uh, memory, of intelligence, and also of a lot of suffering when it's damaged. In the last years, we have been able to develop new techniques to study the brain, its neuroimaging techniques. And this is one of the equipment that I use to study the brain. And it's a, a functional MRI 
And what you do with this machine is you go inside here and we are able to capture how your brain is uh, deploying of the blood flow in the brain. So if you are thinking about something or memorizing, we can detect what are the networks in the brain that lights up. So it's fascinating because like here, you can see what's happening in your brain when you are passively viewing words. This is what's happening now in your brain that you are listening words, it's a large area in the left hemisphere. This is what I'm doing, it's speaking, look how pretty. And it can, we can be so specific as if you ask, if I ask you to generate verbs and actions. So these are really potent uh, images. And I'm gonna show you, we can even, we can uh, see how your brain activates when you see some, when you are thinking something really sad. So if you can raise your hand in the computer, uh, do you think the, le the left is the woman, it's a female thinking something really, or is this one? I don't know if I can see the answers, but. I put it in the chat box. Um, I personally think that maybe the left one would be the female. Uh, Muhammad says left as well. Sophia says right. Um, Lily Santutun says left. Okay, so yes, is is the left because you know here are the eyes. They are really very, very, really sad. But how about the female? You know, it's it's a neurobiological trait because even when you are a mom you can see your son is coming and way in, in the door and you say, oh my God, you have temperature. Come on, what's happening to you? And these are the guys. You really have to be crying and snobbing and they will turn. Is that something happening to you? So emotions are really different organized in the female and the middle brain. But the guys, the, the male guy, uh, it's better for aggression, for detecting aggression. Um, uh, we can also detect what's happening in your brain when you're seeing fear faces. And this is like violent subjects. How, how do they, they function in your brain? They don't feel a lot of fear. Uh, we also, this is a real image of the brain. You can put it in your living room, just like Marvel was. We, we can also detect how the brain is connected. And um, so this is spectrography and you can see the connections of the different areas of the brain. So the brain in the humans have the capacity to speak and comprehend language, to execute fine motor movements like these, to feel very complex emotions like, like pride and like the love and, and like hate. And one important thing is the capacity to express feeling to art. So here is like the brain. Here we have the motor areas, the sensory areas, the auditory areas, the visual areas. And you have this enormous territory to learn and connect. So that's why the human brain has been able to survive in Alaska and survive in Africa. We are not surviving, well, we hope the COVID, but um, uh, it's a different story. So this is a marvelous organ. And how about art? Art is like a human creation and we have different types of art, abstract art and, and the different colors and forms. So this art, Art is one of the richest subject, subjective experience that humans are capable. It has been studied and relegated just to the philosophy and history. So the question is, how does the brain create and respond art? Because the brain is a, the one who creates art. And how do we appreciate art? So uh, in the last years, like since, like recently, since 2000 and 2012, uh, there, there's a new discipline that's called neuroesthetics. 
And what do, this discipline does is it takes a scientific approach to the study of aesthetic sensation, perceptions of art, music, or any object that can give you raise to the aesthetic judgment. It's a scientific study of the neural basis for the contemplation and creation of a work of art and uses neuroscience, this machine that I just showed you, to explain and understand the aesthetic experience at the neurological level. So neuroaesthetics is an intersection of disciplines. I love these slides, you know, I think we have different things of art and this is bringing all the mathematics that goes out there. It's studied by neuroscientists, by art historians, by artists, by art therapists, by psychologists, and everybody gets together and try to understand this fantastic behavior. I'm gonna focus my talk mainly on visual art. Um, and, and this visual art is a product of the visual brain. So uh, for example, in the brain, we have 30 areas. This is the, the uh, eye, and these are the, the networks, that, the, the connections that go into the occipital part of your brain. And there are different visual areas. So when you are seeing visual art, you are stimulating those areas. But these areas are also connected to the limbic system. This is really fun to study, is the emotional brain. So it's not only the back part of your brain, but it's connecting to all the emotions. And here is the limbic system. So with these fantastic machines that function in art, we can study emotion, we can study art, and what's interesting, I'm just going to go little by little. Uh, there are areas that process faces and objects that light up when you see a face. Other areas like when you see color. Other areas when you see movement. And so when you see these artists like Madrid uh, and these drawings, they, it's this, this, this picture of art is called the rape. It go out against everything the brain has seen before in store because that's the area, the face area, is think what's going on. It doesn't look like a face, it looks like a face, whatever. So you get like, wow. So I'm gonna focus mainly, and I know it's maybe a criticism, it's on visual art and aesthetic pretty art. Uh, art, it has to connect to the emotions and you can create emotions not only with pretty pictures, but with blood, with different fluids and all that. So um, I just had to say that. So even in abstract art, Picasso, with rock, uh, in the cubism movement, they eliminate the point of view and introduce different angles. There are different angles. And cubism tries to represent how the brain functions when it creates a perceptual constant, constant, independent, independent of the visual angles. And it's just like, if you study that, it creates you like a, wow, but it shocks you and it moves you to analyze what's going on. Um, Agreed also, he, like in, he works with, uh, with areas that's related to visual ground uh, processing. So it's just like, you can just you start there and then it attracts your attention to see what's going on. How, how, can, the, how can I see the trees and the horse? He's playing with your brain. Uh, Pedro Coronel is a Mexican artist and I, he plays with the color and the texture. So these are like two by three meters, it's huge, but you can see how he plays with the color. So if you see in front of the Coronel, uh, paintings, you can see texture and you can see different uh, hues of colors and, and it's fascinating. Levant, it plays with your also visual areas and um, this is a relay. And uh, Ricardo Martinez is also a Mexican artist who uh, his, his creation 
he takes these very anthropological figures, they are small figures of clay, and he does these huge paintings, three by two, and he tries to get into the essence of these little figures. And he's playing with a form. Al Botero, this is the beach. He's also playing with the form and stimulating different areas of the brain together with the limbic system. Rodan, and these are the spirals of Fraser and the other world by Escher. They're, they're like neurologists. I don't know if they study neurology, but they're playing unconsciously with your brain to create visual illusions. So uh, despite the art is the celebration of human individualism and originality, there are a lot of diversity of styles. People like Ramachandran, who is a great neurologist, Seki, and Solso, and many others, have tried to, 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 to study and to state different laws, principal laws that get transcend cultural styles. I'm not going to talk about all these laws, but I'm going to just give some examples. This is from Ramachandra, who is a great neurologist living in San Diego. And I'm going to talk about six principles in the artistic creation. And what I want you to travel with me is key things that they are, that the artist is playing with the brain and is doing something that provokes a very um, emotional experience. One principle is isolation. So in your brain, you are bombarded in the environment by different, by sounds, by no noise, by smells. So your brain has limited capacity. You need to focus your attention. If you cannot do that, you are in big trouble. So we have limited resources for attention. We cannot attend to everything. So the isolation principle is when the, it, it helps the organism to allocate the, his, his attention effectively. And this is why an outline drawing, this is Matisse, the blue mood, are so effective and they're more effective many, many times than, 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 than photographs. And cartoonists also pick up the special features that are important. And so you can, allow, you can focus your attention. So these are the El Toro, the, the bull, series of Picasso, which is fascinating how he, he, he painted all these. It's a wonderful draw. He draw fun, fantastic. But then he finished with just these few lines that produce you a very attractive um, experience. Uh, I'm going to talk about Fellini. Probably you are too young, but Fellini was an Italian movie director. He got four Oscars. And uh, he, he, one of his, his uh, plays was the Dolce Vita. And he had a very good, uh, um, uh, he had a prize, lots of prizes. And then the, the term paparazzi that everybody used come from a character that he put in that movie, the Dolce Vita. So Fellini was not just such a great, he was really fun to be with, the neurologist. I'm going to tell you why I'm putting Fellini. But this is, he was also, cart he loved to draw cartoons. And this is a portrait of him in a cartoon. So it's really nice. Um, um, uh, so we finished with the isolation principle. We're going to go to the grouping. So uh, Marion, can you help us? Do you discover something in this? Uh, yeah, I can like see a, a dog, kind of like a Dalmatian dog. Right, then, well, maybe you feel a little tingling. Oh, I saw a dog of these points. Did you feel the little tingling? Yeah, also people from the audience are sharing that they also see a dog. Oh, perfect. It's bigger ground, it's grouping. Mm -hmm. So grouping is a capacity to detect the figure from the ground and it's enjoyable. 
And um, Ramachandra said that the source of the pleasure may come about because of the evolution necessity to give the organism an incentive to uncover objects, so, such as predators or noisy environment. So here you are had to survive. So the tiger and, and the, 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 they, they will not attack you and eat you. And you have to have figured ground. So uh, you can, when you discover, wow, that's here the leopard and a tiger or something, there's an aha experience. You just say, wow, are they run or wow? So that's, that's, it's, that's uh, a figure ground uh, art can be uh, really, and it's based on this evolutionary thing. So here we have Gustav Klimt, where you also, he's grouping and um, you are discovering this love and grace through the little flowers and all these things. And Van Gogh, which has a grouping of color, when you see the vase with 15 snow flowers and you see yellow, so it's grouping the yellow. And Chagall is also managing colors, repeating colors all over, and then you discover different figures. And uh, for example, grouping is also used in the fashion. And people, well, I know this is not, but people who work in fashion, they said, oh, this is like their grouping. She's having the white necklace that repeats with ease and the black and she's, so it's also used in fashion. So the other principle, we are in the third, I'm gonna mention six, the abstraction. So abstraction comes from experimental work. And if you reinforce a rat with the circle and not the rectangle, the rat abstracts the circle rat is connected to, to food and that's the limbic system, it's good. So abstraction can be also seen in like Monet's water lilies. It's the abstraction of the lily. You know, it's just like people can see it and he just abstract the essence of the water lily. And Ricardo Martinez, the Mexican that I told you, he abstracts from these figures that are really small ones and with clay, oh, I'm sorry. He just like put love. You should see Marion with her little girl and her little boy. This is love and this is um, mother love and this is another type of so it's an abstraction of the essence of the emotion. Henry Moore, and he will see again Picasso with the abstraction of the woman figure. So um, another principle is proportion. And related to proportion is the question of what is beauty. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are like different philosophical views one is that beauty exists outside the subjects that observes. And that was postulated by Plato and the Greeks who talk about the golden ratio, that's a proportion. And Leonardo da Vinci, he said the proportion is divided by seven. So they tried to study the mathematics of beauty. And other group like David Hume, great philosopher in Kant, in the, since the 18th century, they said that that's nonsense, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And it's not in the quality of the objects, but it's in the subject that observed. So here's proportion. Uh, they said these have a, a magic proportion that what is a golden proportion, that's why it's so beauty. And this is the Botticelli Venus, and he divided in sevens, and they said, that's why it's so beautiful. Uh, Michelangelo in the dying slave, it also has certain proportion. And with regard to the body, the Venus, the Venus of Milo, Milo of Venus is called like that. Uh, so we, we usually as women said, oh, perfect body, 60, 90, 60, 90, that's nonsense. The best proportion from the biological point of view, you have to divide your waist, your waist measure in, uh, and your hip measure. And the 
perfect proportion is 0 0.70. So it's not very skinny enough, but it's a proportion that it's exciting. So the Venus de Milo has uh, 0.68. You can measure when we finish, how's your body? Marie Monroe, it's 0.66. Sophia Loren, which was a sex symbol, 0.68. Twiggy, which was like, just like a skinny, skinny, skinny woman, uh, from sex nine and Kate Moss and Cindy Crawford, they are point is point six eight. So this is interesting and related to this uh, proportion is symmetry. Symmetry biologically is important during choosing a mate as all of these tend to display symmetry in nature. So when you see a symmetry in the face or in the body is associated with infection and disease, which can lead to poor mate selection. And so the symmetry, it's very interesting because Galton, this is Francis Galton, he was a great anthropologist in the 1822 and he did pioneer study of intelligence. He said, I'm gonna make an average of the faces of criminals. And I'm gonna have the archetypical face of a criminal. So he found that that didn't work. And uh, the result was not unique. If you put like the faces of a lot of criminals photographs. But one interesting thing is that they were more attractive, that the average was more attractive than the individual face. So if you average like you have these this is a face, no, a face, and this is like two average here. This is eight average of the same face. This is four, this is 16, this is 32. This is um, from the point of beauty is more beautiful than just two average. And they said that, you know, you can create a hyper fine female or a hyper male. You can see in this drawing is is not it doesn't exist, but she's beautiful. She's it's supposed to be adorable, and uh, these are little like photographs. There are one hundred. It's the average of one hundred and twenty-eight photographs. So if you offer these faces, it looks more beautiful than just your single pictures. So what does that have to do with nature? Like for example, the male pig, which is magnificent, says to the female, hey, watch me, I'm healthy. I wouldn't have grown such a beautiful tail if I have parasites in mind. So come on, mate with me. So in the humans, we have these fleshy breasts that are, according to Darwin, they are their external appendix and our biological signals, they are not useful for survival or you don't need the, bo the boobies for survival. They are even obstacles and only the best feet can develop them and keep them. So this is like another part that people think. So symmetry is used. This is Rivera, Diego Rivera, who was a lover of Frida Kahlo and it's a very well-known painting and this is a monument to love. It's uh, the Taj, Taj Mahal, which is like very symmetrical. And this is Giovanni Strassa. It's, it's said to be, it's in uh, marmol, white marmol. It was, about, it was done in 1835. And this is marmol, isn't that amazing? And it's said to be the most perfect uh, um, sculpture and in that time, people were using a lot of veils and, and it just like, you feel that you can touch it, you know? So symmetry has also had to do with emotion. This is Durero, who put his self-portrayed. Here's like two left halves of his face and he's the two right halves. So your visual system is connected to your limbic system, your facial area, and you can see that this um, shows different emotion than this one, and it's the same guy. So it's interesting that artists use that in the creation. 
So and the, the sixth principle that I want to talk is the metaphor. This is a Mexican painter who is Remedios Barro. And she makes these fantastic drawings. And she is, uh, this is like the, the mother of the birds who is, at night, he, she, she paints different colors of the little birds. And a light from the moon will give them life. And that's why we, they can fly. Uh, another metaphoric painter is Dali, who, uh, who, who painted this, the persistence of memory. And he just like put the concept of time that sometimes stop. And this feeling is captured by Dali in his famous series with the melted clocks. So it just like, it goes and attracts you. So we can say Linas, Roberto Linas, who is a great researcher, brain researcher, says art is a motor expression that, mo that moves us emotionally. It's your, you have like the creative art, you have to do a motor expression, but it has to move you emotionally. And it's linked to emotion and it's part of brain functioning. We are slaves of our emotion and art and brain are linked. I like this definition by a neuroscientist. So when we get into the brain, the brain has two, two the left hemisphere, hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and it's connected by some fibers, the corpus callosum. The left hemisphere is uh, processing language, and it's mainly in conceptual process. And the right hemisphere, here that I'm pointing, it's involved in visual, perceptual, and emotional process. So logic and emotional parts produce an emotional experience when they communicate. With, through the corpus callosum. So we can say another definition of art, the art is an expression of our internal world put into the external world. Uh, and now I'm going to, so we have two hemispheres, the right and the left. We have double consciousness and it may, they may emerge in association with left hemisphere dysfunctions you know, art can, can come when you have lesions in your brain because you are rewiring it. So people like a great neurologist Milner have studied patients and other, other neurologists when, they, when there's a brain lesion. So you can have focal lesions, you can have degenerative disease such as Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia and developmental disorders. So when you have a focal lesion, I told you that the brain you know, the, the nurture of your, your neurons is through the oxygen of your brain. And if you have a clog, like a stroke, in this area, the parietal area, uh, this area is not gonna function. And in some individuals, when you have this stroke, you have, like Federico Fellini, he had a stroke in the left hemisphere after creating the Dolce Vita. So the neurologist study, he was great caricature. This is his self-portrait. So they put this, they study him with this complex image he had to copy it. It is funny because he had such a great, um, he was like, here you can see, you have an Emmy and attention. You meet, he's copying this figure and he's omitting the left part of the, it's a right parietal damage and he's emitting, and then how he recuperate the function and he start to draw the neurologist here, a nude of the neurologist in top of the figure, but he was just joking. And then he keep on, he was recuperating and here's the neurologist again and here again. So for neuroscientists, it's just fascinating to see how the brain is functioning. Another disease that we, start, we have, that, that is really devastating and worry for is Alzheimer. When in Alzheimer, because of the memory problems, we lose the ability to recreate our past. And as a result, we lose the connection with others and with ourselves. So when we talk about memory, you know, memory is the glue 
that bonds the mental experience or what's happening in others and allow us to change and grow through life. So in Alzheimer, you can see the brain just like start to lose, here's the normal brain. And then in Alzheimer, you start to lose all your neurons. This is a healthy brain. And Alzheimer's is just like shrinks the brain. So what's happening, we have an abnormal accumulation of a protein and all these little dots, red dots, are neuro, are uh, uh, amyloid plaques in the brain of a person with Alzheimer. So this is a plaque that it, when you see the brain of these patients, they have um, the brain degeneration. So they see these little dots looks like, like this. They have the, uh, the, brain, the, the neuron is dying and it has a um, yellow aloe around there. So people have studied people, artists, this is William Utenholm, who was a great, great artist in New York. And uh, he's young and then he's like old and he did just fantastic painting that have been sold by half a million dollars, his painting. And he had Alzheimer's disease. This is a wife who took care of him. And uh, he started to do his self-portrait. And this is in the beginning of the disease and how his self-portrait ends, where you see a lot of sad and desperation, but you, he lost a lot of his ability. Another great artist who was an abstract painter and very, very well known of the abstract movement, movement is William Conning. And he did these uh, portraits that were also very popular. He took like one year to draw this. It was a long time. And then he had Alzheimer's disease and this is Marilyn Monroe in 50, 1954. And then how he ended up drawing when he has an advance in 1980 advanced disease. So um, it's interesting because he's studying how the brain deteriorates with the disease, it helps to understand how the brain produces this wonderful air or pro or project. And also uh, it's now used, art is not only used to study patients, but to help them. So there are different programs that's called memory in the making. So they take people who have Alzheimer's disease and they tell them to paint. They don't have, they, it's not that they're going to cure the disease, but it's an emotional expression that people can do and people feel much better. And uh, you are, you are um, trying to stimulate instead of leaving, leaving them in a sofa watching TV, they are expressing their way. Another dementia that is just fascinating, and dementia is the loss of ability because of damage. It's called frontotemporal dementia. Frontotemporal is because it's behind your frontal, uh, your, your uh, forehead and temporal, especially the left hemisphere. And it's very common and is related to a gene alteration that, that, that damage your brain. People who have frontal dementia symptoms have apathy, have social disinhibition, they have distractibility, they have lack of judgment, they have lack of impulse control, they have lack of self-care, and they change in sexual behavior. They are hypersexual and change in eating habits. So it's very interest, interesting, but because the process that can damage so much the brain, there are few cases that present paradoxical functional facilitation and they start to paint and to compose things they haven't done. So I'm gonna ask Ceci, this is Maurice Ravel. Ravel uh, composed the, the Bolero de Ravel. I hope you are hearing. Yes, we can hear the You hear? Yes. Put it more. more. Very famous, isn't it? Okay. Okay, but 
Okay, Sefi, thank you very much. So I go back to my presentation. Oh. So here we are. So Maurice Ravel, why is he interesting from the neurological point of view? Because he composed this uh, thing and, and he had frontotemporal dementia. He composed it when he had frontotemporal dementia. What's interesting about this is that the bolero of Ravel, it's very repetitive. It alternates between two main melodic tunes, repeating the pair eight times over 340 bars with increasing volume. So he's wow. just a it's a compulsive structure of perseveration. And yeah. he has a dimension. So what's interesting is that Miller, who's a neurologist, studied this fantastic woman. She was a biologist. She has 56 years when she studied it. And she also had frontotemporal dementia. She has never, never paid. This is the brain, how it's the, the areas of the brain that are damaged. And what she did is she was inspired but uh, Ravel paints their uh, music. And what he did is he used Ravel's painting, Ravel's music to paint. And she painted one upright rectangular for each part of the bolero. And the, figure, and the figures, like here's the bolero, are orderly manner like the music, countered by a six that's one. So I think it's like fascinating. It's like, making when you and, and she was really good for that. So there's another patient that Eric Eric Men and and leads the group of, of Miller. He described also a 65 year old who was a left-handed city employee who had a cortical atrophy damage in the frontal cortex. And he started to be he started to paint and he's he mentioned he was very disillusioned or very disappointed because people didn't like his latest work, which has shifted from peaceful landscape or still life to erotic fantasy. So look how he's used to draw these. And everybody said, oh, pretty. Then he draws this. And then he started to draw these. Uh, it's like, look very sexy and then uh this is the other ones he was like really and this is simulation in sexual painting and sexual behavior was in real life so um it's a it's a phenomenon that people who had these problems will start to paint after the death and i'm gonna the the last thing about the brain that i want to to share with you is developmental disorders. And children and people who have autism and Asperger's syndromes have uh, difficulty in social interaction and communication. And they also have restrictive patterns of thought and behavior. And um, some of these children, they have these marvelous abilities to paint also. So this is a painting of a four-year-old of a hoax. So this is a normal four-year-old, they paint the, the, the main features. But this is a painting of Nadia. She's a, one, she's a little girl, three years old, and she paints this horse. She couldn't talk, she made repetitive movement, she didn't interact, but she paints the horse. And you can see, this is the horse paint, paint by Leonardo da Vinci, this is a horse paint by a seven years old. And this is Nadia at seven, that little girl. So what you, with, um, Nadia's brain? She has autistic mm -hmm. problems. Like it's, yeah. that's I'm gonna show you. So yeah. this is the horse of Nadia. And this horse of Leonardo da Vinci. This horse has the essence. It's just like marvelous, isn't it? And she's only seven years old when she wrote this. This is another, uh, this is another Stephen that Oliver Sacks reported. 
And it's the Notre Dame chapter. He was 40 when he painted it. And this is another drawing. This is the Chicago theater. He just painted it like that. And he has artistic features also. This is the, uh, is in Amsterdam. And this is the Red Square on Russia. So um, another guy who has been studying is this, uh, this patient. So Kim P uh, was studied by one of my friends and he's also an autistic. He had severe coordination problems. He had problems in, in language, but he had, was able to read in one second a page of a book and remember verbatim. So he has his library and whenever he finished a book, he put it back um, top to bottom. He just put it like that. What's the name, Marion? He just like, is the library and he read a book and he put it like this, he turned it off. So, yes. and that happened. So he had a library full of books that were upside down. And he also played in the piano, the melodies immediately. What happened in the brain of this person? This is interesting. This is the brain of a normal person in a, in a uh, MRI. You can see how it's all these areas. This is a corpus callosum. This is a cerebellum. And this is Kim P. brain. He had problems with coordination. But cerebellum is not developed. He doesn't have a lot of of uh, neurons in the frontal, but it's over populated area of the parietal lobe. It's so like in, in the development of his brain, all the, all the neurons migrate to the parietal area and they were there and they create this genius, but just in one thing. And recently he died, but he shared with us his brain. So, uh, as as uh, this neurologist mentioned, Arctic expression reflects one how one perceives, conceives, and relates to the outer world, and does not require to have language, memory, and conceptual knowledge or abstract reasoning. So the act, artistic expression of those with frontotemporal dementia in other forms of the dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, provide an Otherwise, an otherwise hidden window into a rich and varietal experience of the inner world of the patients who may otherwise struggle to communicate in, in different words. So I think that the visual, like Eggman said, the visual arts provide a powerful avenue for self-expression and their behavior capture in the rawest form, inform us our understanding of humanity as well as human beings. So what's going on now? Uh, can we stimulate our brain and get these capacities? So, well, maybe I'll invite you to my lab and maybe I can, I can do that with you. Uh, this is Alan Snyder. He's a neuroscientist in Australia and he's using magnetic transcranial stimulation. It's on the outside. We just send you, we stimulate your brain with electrical stimulation. And he's trying to stimulate the parietal area outside. And, and so you can do like these type of drawings. Well, it's just uh, you know, in process. So the future of neuroscience to wrap it up all this talk. I think that we are changing instead of being like super specialized in little things like molecular biology and calcium channels and unitary recording, people through neuroesthetica having a holistic vision of the human being and through neurophilosophy and neuroesthetic and neuroeconomics, we are trying to understand how the brain is not only capable of producing language and movement, but generating the most intense experience of human beings and in most irrepressible passions. So uh, we are talking about the brain and the mind, which is something more complex. So I just want to end up 
with these fantastic sculptures of Alexander Calder that uh, these are mobiles that they are like lot, very, very large, like three meters large. And in, in these, in these uh, mobiles, you can see a delicate balance and certain independence of the elements. Calder mobile, mobiles are fragile form from wire threads that hold the elements in such a way they reach a perfect balance in the total creation. And the elements are not totally independent and its action change according to the environment. If we have wind, they will move. And that's what happened in the brain. We have fantastic networks that are connected through these fibers that I showed you before. And there's a balance in our brain. I am a neuroscientist and a neuropsychologist, and I study what happened when a little thing in, in the structure in your brain damaged and how can I repair it? So I think that art can help us to understand and we can, and the science can help to understand art. So thank you very much for your attention. Amazing, Peggy. This is absolutely wonderful. Super, super interesting. I love all this information about how, how we can see a different point of view of what happens in the brain through art. Um, I love this. Thank you so much. We have several questions that, they, that they've sent. Uh, yeah, people from the audience says, excellent presentation. Um, fantastic, great stuff. Thank you. Uh, people are saying that, that wow, they're absolutely um, impressed by all, all the information that you condensed and curated here today. Um, one of the questions that we have, uh, is from Alice, and um, she says, in which part of the brain do we feel emotions through art? And are emotions triggered in the brain or in the body first? How does that well, work, you know, when, when we see something about art or we hear, you know, a piece of music? Well, yeah, it's a fascinating question, a great question. So it's a mixture. I try to just go very, you know, it's not uh, only part, it depends what part is the art is stimulating. Like Ravel is stimulating your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere with the music and temporal area, which is here, right on top of your ears. But the visual art is stimulating the back part, the occipital part of your brain. So it depends. But all this composing is stimulating the limbic system. And the limbic system is related to the emotion. So sometimes you can see something and you don't feel anything. It's not stimulating. It's stimulating just certain parts, but not the emotion. And that's why people said that art has to produce an emotion. If not, it's not art. So people can, you know, I saw in New York a exhibition and they have like a, like a cow who was full with blood. And then he had like the waist of the hard disk and, uh, and, and it was not aesthetic, but it creates an emotion. So the, it's not an only part, it's an interaction, it's networks of the area that stimulate an emotion. And you feel it all over the body because the brain is not separated. It has a big connection with your guts and it, everything is connected. So it's working together. So you feel it with the older body, but your brain has an important part. Wonderful, that's amazing. Uh, we have another question from Edward. What difference uh, appear in the brain between a person that's not an artist and a person who is? What happens inside an artist's brain? Right, you know, we have made some research in my lab, but they, you know, for example, a People who are who know how to play a, a musical instrument and they're artists, they, they're, they're, they're like conductors. We measure the brain and they have a large, a larger cerebellum. Is that your brain change in response to your stimulation and experience? And the artist, uh, it depends uh, what type of creation he has, there's plasticity in the brain. So what I have done is to report like neutral stimulus, photographs and artistic stimulus and see how the brain changes when you're watching that. So um, 
uh, it's a, we, we, I can share some paper that I wrote regarding how the change, how the brain changed in the artist and how the brain changed in the one who appreciates that. Amazing. And there's something also with a question from Marcos that I think it connects, that it says, how can artistic talent be triggered through the brain? Are there kind of like specific exercises that you recommend or that you've seen in your uh, practice that could um, stimulate or improve different parts of the brain where artistic expression is held? You know, it's, it's very interesting because art, you can make a judgment about color, perception, form. I think the more you know about a piece of art, the more you appreciate that piece of art. So in order to increase your appreciation of art, they, then you have to just like see the history, who painted, why he painted, the color, the form, the perspective. And that it's training, training to appreciate art. And that change your brain. The change has neuroplasticity. And as long as you learn things that motivate you, you can be, you're changing your brain all the time. All the time, even as we age? Or do you think that neuroplasticity eventually age more as we, well, neuroplasticity diminishes at uh, the more that we age? Or no, you we know, have the same neuro neuroplasticity. No, we, we have neuroplasticity more, more when you're children because you are making the connection. And when you age, uh, the, the plasticity is it's less, but there is still there. You can really change if you stimulate your brain, not as much as if you stimulate the children. And then, uh, but like normal aging, there are things that grow. They are better than the, the young ones, like vocabulary and semantic knowledge and information. If you are a person who keep on reading, then it's, it's good aging and your vocabulary is much better. In a pathological aging, then these processes are not so well. And they're like, by the disease, like in Alzheimer's disease, they will stop. But uh, you are right. In young brains, they are like a sponge. Okay, okay, okay. And there's another question from Veronica that might have to do something with this. She says, we know that ideas have electricity vibration in the brain that we are able to observe in EEGs. Do emotions have also electrical vibrations and can they be measured? Well, yes, you know, the brain communicates through neuro with, with chemicals and you have synapses. So we have different neurotransmitters in the brain, like 50 neurotransmitters, we have dopamine and serotonin and uh, the, the neurons communicate with spikes. When there's a neurotransmitter, and one neuron is talking to the other one. That's what we do in the EEG. We measure that communication. And when we stimulate the neurons of the different type of art, you can measure that in the EEG and, uh, and with uh, uh, event related potential, which is what I do in my lab. So you can see what's happening in your brain when you see different types of arts in uh, people who are Non, non specialists and with specialists because they see different things. If you are a specialist in art, then, then you are just seeing, oh, that's really pretty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, totally. And from Ingrid, what could have caused Alzheimer's disease in those artists featured? Is there something specific that you can see in advance? Is it kind of like a gene that mutates or how is it created? Oh, Alzheimer's disease is, is something, um, we, we still don't know exact answer, but we know there is an accumulation of a, a protein that's uh, um, beta amyloid, amyloid protein. Everybody has that protein and is involved in the processing of cholesterol in your brain. What happened with Alzheimer's disease is that these molecules of, of beta amyloid, they break in the heart. Mm -hmm. And instead of breaking the half, they break like a big piece. That big chunk of beta amyloid gets accumulated in your brain, and then you start it. But it gets, it starts with the memory system, and then it, it, it progresses into other areas of your brain. 
and then you lose your memory and you lose the capacity to recognize yourself and recognize your loved ones. And mm -hmm. what these artists, they, they, they were really compulsive great artists and they were painting and painting and they got the disease. So people go to the earliest painting and to the last painting and you can check when they are losing their zest of painting and you can see how they are and what areas of the brain are doing this process, okay. which is different than in the frontotemporal dementia, that you can have this terrible behavior, and then you are painting this marvelous thing. I had a patient who was completely illiterate. He didn't write, and when he had um, he had frontotemporal dementia, he started to draw in three dimensions. Wow. He was amazing. You know, it's it's not often, but it happens. It happens. Wow, that's amazing. And we have here a comment from Bernadette. She says, I have been working for several years with music and dementia, as well as other conditions, and the results are fabulous. Art has the power to humanize as no other vehicle I know. How, what have you seen in all of your studies, all of your EEGs about uh, art having the power to humanize? Oh, I completely agree because, you know, art, especially if you work with dementia and music, is not curing art, it's not curing the person because the facts are there and the generation of neurons, but you are getting in touch with your emotional part. You can feel free to express and people will say, they may not remember. You know, I have a patient who will draw these beautiful colors and then uh, the daughter took it to the house and she said, she came to the house, the, art, the patient, they said, what a beautiful drawing, who drew it? And it was her, mm -hmm. but you know, the part of leaving your emotion free, nobody's telling you it's bad, it's wrong. They're not teaching you, it's just like an expression. And memory in the making just make these people very happy patients. They may even not remember, but the emotional part is there. So I think it's, it's uh, if you go into memory in the making, is a technique that we have been used to stimulate and have a very better quality of life for people with Alzheimer's. Yeah. And what would you recommend uh, for, for memory loss? Is there something that we could, because I think also we're we're presenting, um, there's more people around the world who are having more Alzheimer and more memory loss than, I don't know, many years ago, also because we live longer, right? right. But also, I think we might be saturating our brains way more than maybe a century ago that we were saturating more our bodies instead of our brains. What would you recommend for memory loss? You know, I'm going to tell you, there's no magical pill yet. To develop. So if you take ginkgo biloba and all these things, it doesn't really help a lot. The ginkgo biloba that they sell in the supermarket, like I don't know if we have some audience from Germany, but there's a good quality ginkgo biloba. And ginkgo biloba here in the supermarket in Mexico and in the US, nothing. It just like it just helps to vascularize your brain. Like the, the brain flow is better. But you if you have hypertension is not good to take the ginkgo below, but that's like with pills. So memory is constantly a construction. If you try to remember, like in my textbook, if you try to remember, like remember like the, the ray figure, complex figure that Fellini copy, if you try to copy detail by detail by detail by detail, and then 20 minutes later, I said, what do you remember from your copying? If you copy it by detail, by detail, you will not remember. But if you make a structure and you have a big structure of the big figure and then the detail, you will remember. So if you organize your memory, in instead of trying to remember each detail, you don't saturate your memory. You, you don't overload. So you think in terms of concepts, like, it's maybe like if you go to the supermarket and you have to remember uh, all the lists, if you organize, I have to get a daily six things, vegetables, six things, that will foster your memory and you can remember more. 
So you have to organize your memory and that will improve the performance. I don't know if it's an answer, but it's yeah, organizing. Yeah. No, it is, it is. That helps a lot. Amazing. We have another question from Zenobian. When we say that trauma rests in the body and also there is a disassociation with extreme trauma, how do we see it through art and neuroscience? How do you see trauma in the body through art and neuroscience? Of course, like trauma, like traumatic stress disorders, trauma sometimes get in the body and then you, you, you have a lot of other diseases and, and you are stuck with that. And what therapy does is just help you to remember the trauma, to get into the cortex and say, what happened to me? So you can feel it in your brain because sometimes it starts in your body. And that's why you have all these um, diseases that you are so stressed and you cannot sleep, you cannot eat or you overeat. So the trauma techniques are trying to, so you can manage your trauma, make it conscious and work on it. So that's how you do it. But yes, it's very yeah. important. It's a whole body, mind, body experience. Connection, of course. Uh, there's another question from Ira. Is art appreciation more about perception or about creativity? Uh, well, art appreciation is you as a person seeing a painting and say, oh, wow, I appreciate it. I do like it. But it's also about creativity because you can um, be mesmerized by metaphors, mm -hmm. by uh, the creative and conceptual aspect of the painting. And it could be like just lines, like Picasso, the bull of Picasso. So mm -hmm. it's appreciation of the detail. It's like the six principles, but more. Mm -hmm. They are taken in, in our mind so you can have the aesthetic experience. It's not just one real thing. So it's about the whole. Mm -hmm. Amazing. We're having way more questions about also Alzheimer's disease. So um, there's another question from Ingrid. How do we distinguish just average forgetfulness from more serious brain disease? My husband was very forgetful and disorganized for years. Today he has been diagnosed with white matter disease. What can you tell us about this? Oh, yes. You know, the neurons have the action, the parts, and the white matter disease it has a problem, usually it's related to diabetes and to other diseases. So the, the neuron is not communicating. In Alzheimer's disease, the difference is that the neuron is getting the disease. Mm -hmm. So with age, we do forget things, but there's different types of memory and different stages of memory. I hope I'm not so technical, but you have the codification of information, you mm -hmm. hear information, then, there's a hippocampus, it's a little structure in your brain that has, it's called a hippocampus. Mm -hmm. And then you keep the information there. And then there's the recovery. So it's coding, storage, and recovery. Some Alzheimer's disease have problem in the storage. They paint the drawing, and one minute later I said, can you paint your drawing? The, 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 a figure, but mm -hmm. what are you talking about? Like the storage is disappeared. It's mm -hmm. not there. It just went away. Some mm -hmm. of the people will have the storage, okay, but they cannot recover. That's what happened to my students. They will say, oh, doctor, I really know the answer. So just give me a small clue and I will remember. So it's one, one it's like recognition is easier than storage. So you said, give me, give me, give me that thing that takes my headache away. You don't remember is that real, it's, uh, it's uh, Thailand or whatever, but you have the concept. Mm -hmm. So in evaluation, you have to see if it's coding, storage or retrieval. Mm -hmm. And also attention. Attention is related, something that you don't attend. Attend is not being awake, it's something in your brain. Yeah. And so you can, so sometimes you don't attend and if you don't attend, you cannot memorize. So that's what a neuropsych evaluation, and it's different 
according to your neuropsych performance and according to the etiology of the dam, what causes the dam. So yes, we are forgetting because we are not paying attention. We are multitasking and that's not Alzheimer's disease. That's attention. Oh, and really? in Alzheimer's disease is a storage problem. It's like the, 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 the memories just disappear. Very interesting. I don't know if I was too. Oh, this is fantastic. Uh, then we're having uh, some gender questions uh, from an anonymous attendee. Do males are more emotional or females? What happens? No. With uh, well, what we find this is an average. We can have fantastic males who are really emotional, but an average, like the the I've done that research. We've registered females and males in my lab, and we have a battery of emotion. And, and the female can get more and more rating. You can see, you can put one to seven scale. This is very pretty, not so pretty, normal, neutral, a little, you know, all these gradients. The guys will say, not pretty, pretty, neutral. They have three categories. You know that. Uh, you know, I never find a guy who says it's like really nice, like in Spanish, is rosa mexicana, rosita, pinky. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't give pinky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of like more. You know, mm -hmm. It's the like explain. So, and the explanation of that is because in neurobiology, the woman had to take care of the kids, mm -hmm. and if you are not sensible to all these screens of emotional disease, the species will disappear. The yeah. guys develop this sense that they can detect aggression because like way back then, they had to go and, and fight with the animals and kill them and defend the thing, the, the, the other humans in the, the hut. So the story is that Emotions is different in female and male. I work with also with transgenders, the people who change their sex and yeah, and what happens. That's another story. You can invite me again. I'll tell you about the emotions and all these things. And uh, but in general, so the guys are the male is good for aggression, mm -hmm. and the female they detect it really fast, and we are better for everything else. Amazing. I love guys. I'm not, I'm not saying something bad about them. <laughs> and uh, well, we have uh, the last um, two questions because we have to close soon. Uh, it's from Zenobia and that connects it with Susan as well. Can we have more understanding of Parkinson's? What happens in the brain and how we can help the patient? And is Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease reduced in vegetarians? Have you researched anything about that? Well, I do. <laughs> I work with Parkinson disease patients. Parkinson is another disease of the brain where you lose uh, neurons to produce dopamine. It's the substantia nigra. So you will have Parkinson disease uh, uh, like tremor and rigidity and, and slow movement, slow mo walking uh, when there's 80% of the neurons of the substantia nigra destroyed. Mm -hmm. So 80% is a threshold. So that's why they give, so the patient will start to tremble. Uh, in the dopamine system, you have a cognitive system and a motor system. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's gradually affecting both the, the motor system and the cognitive system. Uh, usually there's no treatment for Parkinson. We have medication that helps, it's like, they give cinnamon or something that helps to, to produce more dopamine in the brain, which is what the substantia nigra cells do. So, so far, of course, the food that you take, if you are taking food that it just cause inflammation in your system uh, and just like very fast sugar, that will not help with attention, attention concentration of that. But it's not a cure for the part. It's just like it's it's just like the better functioning. There's food for your brain, and 
for your brain is like something that helps you attend and concentrate and, and that helps the vascularization of the brain. So yeah. yes, uh, so far Alzheimer and Parkinson are the are really worried from humanity because we're aging and that's you know you said I'm gonna rock it. I have 65, I'm gonna just get off work mm -hmm. and then you get the whole shower part of mine. Oh my God. So you should rock it now, not wait until you're 65. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. When, then we're closing with last question from Rainy. Does art and creativity help to cope with OCD and psychosis? Well, um, I think it will help cope, of course, because obsessive compulsive disorders and psychosis are, you know, it depends, but it's just related to your brain and your nervous system. So you repeat and repeat and repeat. In cases, such as the biologist that I show that took the Ravel thing. She has a frontal lobe damage and she has repetitive compulsive behaviors that she put it in the painting. But the painting was fascinating. It gives her something to give and she gave us a song. So. Ravel, which is beautiful. You know, they are too young, but there's this, this movie that's called Ten, the Perfect Woman, where they put for their it was like, while running in the sea with the bolero of Ravel. And he's like just mesmerized watching her. And Ravel is composed that when he had frontal temporal dementia. So yes, keep on doing. Art and emotions are linked to your inner world. Maybe you cannot say those words and you cannot just tell like, like the woman, the person who asked me about trauma, you have it there but you cannot put it into words. So they are so hurtful that it's terrible, but maybe you can express it to us through colors, to whatever, just leave your body. And that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Amazing, thank you. We could go on with these questions forever. They're super interesting, but we're running out of time. And um, thank you so much for your time today. This uh, presentation was super interesting we're having amazing comments in the chat box that uh, they love this presentation that's super interesting uh, they're asking uh where can they get more access to this information so we shared your web page and the twitter over on the chat box so then everybody can follow you and keep on the conversation going um, thank you so much uh for to peggy and everyone who has joined the session from around the world we had such an incredible community here today from people connected from Mexico, the US, Canada, Venezuela, Philippines, India, Rwanda, Pakistan, uh, many parts of Europe. Thank you so much for being here today with us. We encourage you to follow us on Instagram and YouTube for the latest news, and please feel free to answer the feedback form. All kinds of suggestions are more than welcome and help us deeply improve. During these sessions, together with illustrious industry leaders, we will explore deeply important and rapidly evolving themes. Our next session will be next Wednesday, February 3rd, same time as today, with Emily Verges Winter. She's a creative teacher who explores the philosophical questions and thoughts related to the ethics within today's ecological challenges. After years working with digital services to analyze sustainability within the global supply chains, she started her work within environmental humanities and ethical philosophy. In next week's session, we will hear and talk about the perfect ethical storm of today's ecological challenges and collectively elaborate ways on how to shift our ethical values for virtues that nurture nature around us. We will have an interactive exploration about the various challenges we face in our daily lives and ways to encourage empathy within our surroundings. We will explore this together through an experience with poetry and artistic practices in an interactive form and group sharing. Click the link that we shared in the chat to register. Thank you again. Have a fantastic afternoon, great evening, a wonderful rest of the day. Stay safe and stay healthy and see you very, very soon. Peggy, thank you so much for being here today with us. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Good luck on all your projects. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye.